see. Does it stream? Let's check YouTube. You, you, you were working there, YouTube. All right. One minute there. We are live. Oh, it does say live. Okay. We'll take take its word. Take take YouTube's word for it. Cool. Okay. So hello. Today. Hello. I've decided that I wanted to try and design and implement a rock paper scissors game. Um, Ooh. In Haskell, because I just wanted to try something new, try something that uh, I've learned from the book that I'm currently reading. I can't actually show the book on screen because I, I, I paid for it and the author w will not be very happy with me if I show the book on screen. So What's the, what, what's the book called? Like, what is the book teaching you? Uh, it's called, I think, what was it? Is, uh, functional Design and Architect by Alexander Grainen. Uh, uh -huh. Should be this one, I think. Inside a black what? Dot dot dot. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, cool. <laughs> so just for the record, uh, do you remember that weird uh, snippet that I I sent you from a book that I'm reading? <laughs> Yes. Oh, yeah, about the planets <laughs> and the weird. <laughs> That's Imagine you were in a planet. Oh, I see. That okay. is from this book. <laughs> so that was all about like how do you design a persistence layer in uh, in high school. So uh, that's that's all from this book. Um, right now, uh, I have Haskell set up. It was actually really easy to set up Haskell. Let me see if I can even show it here. Uh, might be at the top. Nice. Yeah, so Haskell these days has gotten a lot easier to set up. You can just do like a sudo apt-get install Haskell platform. Sweet. Yeah, it's always nice when you, when the language gets a little bit more developed and it, you don't have to monkey around with. Yeah, and then I, and, stuff. and then since I have Cabal, I was able to use like Cabal build. Well, I, I tried using Cabal build and it's like, oh, you're using the legacy style thing, and it wasn't. See how I wasn't able to get like my dependencies. Like, that was kind of weird. So is Cabal build like a Haskell compiler or something? Or uh, Cabal, Cabal, rather? It's kind of like a package manager more, I think. like, uh -huh. Kind of like uh, Cargo or like uh, NPM. How come you're using it to build stuff, then? I don't know. That's These days, your package manager also does your builds, too. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's how it works uh, these days. Uh, cargo does this, too. You can go like Cargo Build. Cargo mm, actually, that's true. And then That's how it works build. at Amazon as well. The, like the Amazon internal thing, uses mm -hmm. it like does all your dependencies for you, and you also use it to build. So yeah. that That's checks out. That's like the the new way of doing things. But yeah, this right. this is used to get the dependencies. So, I'm well, thinking like NuGet. It's like you'll never be able to build with NuGet, but it does all your dependency stuff for you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but this one actually, uh, so I, I did the um, Cabal build. It actually didn't work. And I complained about you know me using yo Cabal dependencies. Version. I need to use a, oh. the the new version of Cabal build and stuff. Uh, okay. Because they actually have a Cabal v2 build, and that actually does fetch all your dependencies and stuff. If you if you want to do it the old way, I think you actually have to manually install all your dependencies with like Cabal install. Oh dear God. Yeah, it's. I think it was pretty terrible, but yeah, I, I just did the v2 but, build. Yeah, downloading, installing, blah blah blah, and just pull them all down for you. Very yeah, nice. so that that all worked really nicely. I, I'm actually very happy with that. Cabal v2 dash run does the same thing as like a, car, a cargo run, so it just runs the executable. Okay. So Cabal, it's a Debug. package manager plus handles your build stuff all in one. Yeah, I, I I think so. It, at least that's how it, it, that's how it feels. I don't know. Is it used for other languages as well? Looks like a separate thing. No, it's used just for Haskell. It's not used for anything else. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, getting started with Haskell and Cabal. Okay, cool. Gotcha. Yeah. But this is, uh, I think this is using this new, like, Nix-style local build thing. Nix is another package manager, and that one is, like, um, that's language agnostic. I'm not really sure what exactly Nix is. It kind of sounds a bit, like, chocolatey to me. Like, I think a lot of people describe mm, chocolatey I like chocolatey. As, a, as, like, a package manager. So, like, Nix is sort of, like, a, a functional version of that. So, I don't, I don't really know why uh, Nix exists and w what they're using it for. But, you know, anyway. N Nix is a thing. <laughs> Yeah. I remember the first time I used Chocolatey, it was to install curl on Windows. And it was like, okay, so you can do this in one line with Chocolatey, or you can follow this, like, three-page guide <laughs> yeah. to do it manually. And I was just like, what? Yeah, this no, is the best thing! <laughs> just just use Chocolatey. 
It's a similar thing with Nyx is like if you want to install Idris, you could follow like a really long guide on how to install like all the components. Like you just install GCC or whatever. Yeah, set exactly. Up, That's set up your environment variables. Blast. It's like, bleh. But you can just like Nyx install Idris too, and it's just like, oh, it works. Wow, easy. So yeah, that's uh, that's what Nix uh, is. Um, cool. So have we have you like built the run the Hello World in Haskell with Cab Cabal just to make sure everything's. Oh running? yeah. Okay. So check check this out. Um, we're okay. gonna do a Vim Hello World source. Of also, I'm curious about that. HS. This is our Hello I've, World. I've literally never seen Haskell. So. All right. Yeah. This is yeah. this will be great then. Uh, so this is what our <laughs> Hello the, World. Looks let like. the drinking from the fire hose begin. <laughs> okay. This is super uh, interesting and different. So I personally don't okay. write a lot of module. Haskell. Cool. Yeah. So this defines a module called main, and these are okay. the list of things that we export from that module. So these are essentially uh, these are the things that we make public from this module. Oh uh, wow. A, a module that's confusing. Just, yeah. A module Usually just... that's like those are the inputs, but nope, that's actually no, yeah. the outputs. No, no, no. Yeah. Wow. There's... The the inputs would be done with like uh, I think just like regular like import blah. I haven't actually done that yet. We're going. But to if have you wanted to, to like pass in something on the command line, if you're executing this like on the command line, or do you wanted to pass in some flags or something like that? Oh, then you just I think you would just change the signature of main. I actually don't know how that works because again I like like I said I don't actually use Haskell very much at all. <laughs> like okay. I, I I'm literate in Haskell. But that's mostly because I've had to be in order to understand stuff from like Idris and like Rust. Oh, literate. I oh. can't read Haskell. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. You you will you will learn a little bit of Haskell today. And I'm not gonna okay. do anything super crazy. Well, actually, mm, it depends. I, I, I'll explain everything. I'll explain everything. So why are you choosing Haskell if you don't use Haskell very often? Is that what the, the language a, of the book? That's a really great question. So yes, it is the language of the book. But on top of that. It has uh, it has a more powerful type system than Rust, and so it allows me to do more things uh, that the book does, for example, than what Rust would allow me to do. But what, could you give me an example, like a more powerful type system? So what does that mean exactly? So like, does that mean you can like define all crazy things as all sorts of crazy things as a type? Like, uh, or what? Well, not exactly. I mean, there are uh, language extensions to do that. Um, more powerful, I mean, you can take something. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me let me start by explaining what a type constructor. Is. So you 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 know what lists are, right? Or arrays. In I should hope so at this point. <laughs> so you're you're familiar <laughs> with that concept, right? Like in Java, you oh, like have yeah. like an array of integers, right? I do work as a professional software developer. <laughs> I do know what an array is. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> Just making sure. So you know how normally you have like an array T, like it takes some kind of parameter, some type parameter. Sure. Yes. Uh, and then when you give it an actual like parameter, like int or bool, then you actually get you you get a, an actual type that you can use. Like you can define a variable A. And, you, you can know, store bulls in there. Yeah, and just and like in, for days. instantiate as like an empty array or a list or whatever, right? Like, right. that's the, you know what this is an array of bulls. If I just call it array, you don't know what the heck this thing is, right? It doesn't make sense. It's array. A mystery. It's like um, an interface or something like that. It's like array is not indeterminate. A type. This is this right. is one of the core concepts of uh, you know this uh, type theoretical so, thing. That right. With like without the extra component, it's not a type. So what would you call it then if it's not a type? I guess, a, like, I can see where. Oh, go ahead. It's called a type constructor. Ooh, Why? I see. Because it takes a type and then it constructs a type from that. So if I give it right. int, if I apply int, like, if it's it's almost like applying ar the array function to an argument, right? I give it. It? It, it, it. It's almost like a function from like type to type, right? That's what, or the, right. that's what this Well, is. but hold on a sec. Oh. But it's not going from type to type. It's going from type constructor to type, right? No, it's taking it's a type. It's taking and a returning. type. Oh, okay. So it's taking an int uh -huh. and it's returning an, an array int. Yeah, so array okay. itself has uh, this type, type to type, is essentially how, it, uh, how we would describe it. Right, okay. And so well, the, the type of a type is usually called a kind. <laughs> so this, so we would say that array has kind type to type. 
so sort that, of like the signature kind yeah, of yeah it's like of, the, it's the, that's the kind signature of array so this is this is getting into like higher kindedness so in haskell what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to write functions that or, or that take um type constructors as arguments rather than just uh, regular types so if so i you can say, take just take an array for example yeah like not if a, i write a function a, okay. foo right and normally uh actually let's write this in a very uh java e syntax well how do they do it it's like public void whatever right uh, name foo, and then argument uh, list blah 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 then... yeah we'll, we'll just pretend that there's something here okay so normally you'd have like a, a generic here like a you could take an array of a's right something like that something like that what you can do in haskell is take a type constructor like this and you can now make it completely generic over both the type constructor and the type that it's parameterized by so mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that you can do in haskell so that, that's what okay. makes haskell... so you can sort of like step up one level of abstraction sort of yeah exactly and this can be useful for certain things like uh i'm going to reach into the, like my rust terminology here but like you in rust we have two smart pointer types we have rc and arc for example and like this allows you to implement like garbage collection in case you have like i don't know like a cyclic graph or something like that and th what arc is is it's an atomic reference count which means that you can have garbage collection through reference counting but it's atomic meaning that it's thread safe and unfortunately because these are two separate types um what ends up happening is anytime you want to write a function that you know takes uh, that, that does some kind of garbage collector even if it doesn't care uh, if it's thread safe or not uh, you have to implement it two times you have to implement a a, a non-thread safe version and a thread safe version or you know uh if you know you're never going to use uh, one of these two variants, you just implement one of them. But I mean, like in theory, if you wanted to have like a non-thread safe version and a thread safe one, you'd have to always implement functions that take um, one of the, one of these things and then the other. So you're essentially duplicating uh, your code base, which kind of sucks. Uh, but if you are able to, you know, abstract over that and say like, oh, such that f you know, Im implements like the uh, pointer family uh, interface, for example, then you're able to actually write code that is agnostic of the actual uh, pointer type. So that's actually really useful um, if you're trying to do that kind of stuff in Rust. Rust doesn't have that feature currently. It's called, uh, they're currently calling it uh, gen generic associated types, I think. But yeah, that's. That's essentially the gist of uh, why that would be useful. And there's a lot of places in Haskell where we're going to be using that today. So fun stuff. OK. Yeah, from my, my object-oriented brain, keeps trying to make the connection to interfaces. Like, it seems similar to what we do with an interface in terms of, like, it you can is. pass an interface, and it can be polymorphic. and Yeah. It is. Yeah. Uh, the way that generics work is they're, at least in Haskell, is they're, they're, um, they, they implement a kind of parametric polymorphism. So it's just a different kind of polymorphism. But yeah, right. polymorphism is that generalized concept that you're thinking of. And it's just that in object-oriented programming, we happen to use like subtype polymorphism everywhere because we, know, we, we, we like to think of everything as like a subclass of another thing in OO. It's just easier that way if you have like a single hammer to swing at every single uh, thing in the universe than to have specialized tools for you know specific use cases depending on the context like right the, okay oh is kind of more of a big sledgehammer whereas haskell's like a bunch of tool tools like a, a screwdriver uh, a regular hammer uh, there's still the sledgehammer if you need it but you know you don't necessarily want to use it everywhere in this in this metaphor tools are different types of polymorphism uh you could say that there's there's a lot of different ways of accomplishing the same thing i guess you could say like uh, accomplishing like inversion of control in haskell versus um oop i'm actually going to be showing off one of them today that's going to be one of the main attractions um but yeah just to give you like a quick rundown before we really get started here uh, so I already told you about the module syntax. You know how that works. Uh, do you understand this? What's going on here? Well, I can see we have basically a print line that's printing high, and above that, 
Uh, are we like importing some kind of an I/O class, or, or I guess not a class because we're in functional? Programming. Uh, that's part of the base libraries or something, or like standard. I don't know. Right. Yeah. yeah like that's... the standard, the standard class library, but not classes because yeah, this is Haskell. that's built in. So right. um, Haskell, because it's trying to be hip and cool, uh, it's basically doing this, <laughs> except it's getting rid of the angle brackets. So. Uh, that's not a type. That's a type constructor, I.O. And the type so what... that we're supplying it is this weird uh, empty tuple type, which you can read as void from uh, Java. It's a little bit different from how void works in Java, but it's essentially, it, 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 like semantically, it, it's basically the same thing. So I.O. is a type constructor, and it's taking void, and it's producing what? Like, what's the other side of the arrow? There is no other side of the arrow. <laughs> so this is a function that we, we could write it out as this. It takes like um, a, a nothing and it returns like an IO, uh, essentially a void. Um, OK, so is this just like we're just doing it for the side effect of somehow having access to IO? Yep, that's exactly what that okay. says. So cool. because this function does IO, it's going to. Um, it's so now all of a sudden we IO. have access to like the print print string line method because we've yep because we've we're in on that weird haskell import that's not an import it's a but it kind of is an import uh it's just part of the type signature i could define a foo with a type signature of like i don't know uh i hope this is a type in haskell i think it's probably gonna be capitalized probably int to int and we could Give it a parameter called a, which is an integer. So we put on the left side the equals to say it's a parameter, right? That's what this is. Uh, everything to the right of the last arrow is uh, the return. Uh, I can also do this. So it's going to return another type constructor. It's not going to return a type constructor. This is um, remember this is on the level of uh, types, not kinds. This is just a regular function that takes two arguments. Okay. So this takes two integers. A and B, that's what I've called them down here, and then it just returns A. So, uh, if I return, if I call foo with arguments A and, uh, oh, sorry, one and two like this, uh, the output will be one. That's pretty much all there is to this. And of course, I can't use uh, that parentheses notation because Haskell hates parentheses. You you can see that from this put string line, like in Scala or Java, it would look something like this. Haskell's like, nah, we don't need those. <laughs> so that's why you don't see that very often. Um, you're probably wondering, how do I like chain together a bunch of like print line statements, right? Um, that's easy. There's a special notation called do that lets you do the same thing uh, like this. Say hi, world. Uh, this should work, I think. Uh, Actually, let me, let me split my editor here and stretch it up a bit. I just, just want to give myself some space. Uh, where should I keep my terminal? I'll keep it above just for now. And, of course, it doesn't auto-split anyway because I'm stupid and I forgot. All right. We're going to do a cabal v2 run. Or actually, no. We're, I think we got to... Actually, I don't know. Let's, let's try the v2 run and see what it does. I'm actually not sure what this is going to do. I think it does rebuild. Yeah, it does. So there we go. Now it prints high and world on two separate lines. So that's uh, how you chain together multiple things. Uh, or that, that do I.O. My brain just wants to put them on two separate lines. Or like put a semicolon after. Everything? But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are no semicolons here. Uh, but you need that do. Like, you can't just put those two things on two separate lines. You need do. Yeah, you need that do. That do is very important. Because this is actually syntactic sugar for uh, a bunch of function calls. So you can actually chain these things without using do. Uh, you'd have to use, like, a special operator. Or it's not really special. It's just, you know, it, it just looks a little funny. But uh, then, you could all, then you could actually lay it out on, like, a straight line. And that works, but... The do notation is just syntactic sugar for that, and it makes it read like an imperative program. So that's why a lot of people say that Haskell is a great imperative programming language as well as a functional one, and and that's because you know you can actually recover this imperative style uh, in 
a purely functional setting. So it's, it's still purely functional. It's all still pure functions under the hood. It's just that it reads like an imperative program. And so... And what exactly is the definition of an imperative program or an imperative programming language? Uh, my... Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of uh, going based off of what I know and not like a formal definition, but essentially in an imperative program, you're essentially... The word imperative basically implies that you know you're 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 telling someone to do something, right? Like when you're speaking sure. in the imperative, yeah. you're 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 commanding. And in this case, uh, when you are writing an imperative program, you're essentially writing a series of commands, right? Like there's a there's a sequence to them. There's an ordering, and they're and you're 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 issuing commands to a machine. You're telling the machine what to do. Right. And this is opposed to not a functional style because obviously functionality or like a functional programming style and uh, imperative style are they're, they're, they're orthogonal concepts but the uh, going in the other direction would be a more declarative style where instead of um, taking this approach of I tell you what to do at each step I kind of take a more like global approach you could say like I uh, uh, like, well, what's an easy uh, example of like a uh, imperative versus declarative program? I th I'd say something like uh, I don't know. Adding two to each number in a list. Uh, so we could take like a list of oh god no the syntax in Haskell is awful but we take like a list of integers return a list of integers. Actually that should be int caps. Oops how do I do that? Oh no! <laughs> I'm in the wrong mode. Okay. So I take a list of integers, and it could be like, uh, we'll just call it x's. And one thing that you can do in Haskell is you can call like map, right? And you can give it like a lambda function, like so, and call x plus 2. And then you supply the list x's as the other argument. Uh, we'll just put parentheses around this, I think. And this will just add two to each uh, element of the list. But the imperative way of doing this would be to actually like define like a straight up for loop, right? And then on and then on each iteration of the loop, you're describing exactly what happens. Uh, you're like taking you're like creating a new mutable variable, for example, and then or I don't know. <laughs> you, you you can kind of, you kind of get what I mean, right? Like you just, you're, it, it, I kind of get what you mean. Although it seems like, like the second, like the first thing you talked about was kind of like syntactic sugar for the second thing. I guess like one, one other thing I find it is, confusing is it is actually yeah. just kind of syntactic sugar for it. And it and yeah, like the difference between like a declarative style and an imperative style is really just how you look at it. Like sometimes you can actually just take a function that is perfectly um, imperative, like fork process or something and just rename it and that gives it a more declarative meaning a more declarative reading so Interesting. it's yeah it's almost entirely more like a syntactic thing or like a, a readability thing but it, the, the, it, it changes the way that you reason about it and so the, the whole point yeah. of the uh, declarative style or the declarative approach is to try and create these like maps and filters and fold chains and stuff like that and it looks like a series of transformations over the entire collection rather than you iterate over the collection and then you do a bunch of like small um, small step uh, changes there. Uh, Interesting. I've, so like... I've seen a sort of like a analysis that uh, compares this to like physics. Like um, when you're doing classical physics and you're doing like projectile motion, you're kind of calculating where the ball will be at, ne at, the, at the next step. That's more like an imperative approach, whereas... You know, you've got certain things like the lens laws that kind of give you a formula that you can apply to like, you, you just plug in some parameters and it just outputs like the, uh, you know, the, the correct angle or whatever. It's uh, it's like, mm. that's a more like declarative or like more global approach. But yeah, that's that... almost like a difference of granularity. Like you're kind of zoomed out with the declarative approach and you're zoomed in with the imperative approach where you're really yeah. being explicit about every single thing. Yeah, exactly. And there's nothing inherently wrong with imperative programming. It's just that functional programmers tend to avoid doing too much imperative programming. Like they, they like you will see every 
functional program that does anything useful does have an imperative component to it. It'll, they'll be using this do notation, but they try to keep it to the boundaries of their program and they try to keep the rest of it relatively declarative. I mean, obviously, deep, deep, deep down, some parts of your code are going to be slow and you're going to want to use an imperative approach to make it faster with like mutable variables. So there's those are that's the other case where you might want to use imperative programming, but otherwise, yeah, we, we, we try to avoid doing too much imperative stuff. Hmm. So yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to like map that to sort of a familiar thing for me for from the object OO world and uh, link. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I I totally know you can do this sort of stuff like in in C sharp and in in Java they have these like map and filter and reduce kind of things you can do. Yeah. But I just mean like. If we think about these things in terms of level of granularity, like in any program, I guess you have this decision that you have to make, like, okay, at what point do I want to refactor this chunk of code into a separate function mm -hmm. and sort of zoom out in that particular area? So like, would, would that be a like an imperative versus declarative distinction, like in terms of how you're sort of chunking up your code and how much you're being explicit and um, just like sort of unfolding methods, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean exactly by that. Like, if you're using those methods, that's generally the declarative way of doing things. I mean, it's not necessarily the declarative way, but it's, it, but in general, that's... Uh, if, you, if you're avoiding loops, then that's a good sign that you're writing a, a more declarative code. Um, Right. I'm mean, like I'm just thinking. So we were talking earlier how, you know, this like map operation that is going to add two to each element in the list, it's basically syntactic sugar for the uh, imperative example you gave, where you had the let and you had this loop that was. Oh actually... yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. So like this do thing, yeah, it is the imperative syntactic sugar for something that does. I don't know. It, it might look something like uh, like this actually. Uh, this isn't correct, but it might look something like this. You you could do something like this instead, and that would also work, but it looks a little bit uglier, and also kind of just goes off to the side like this, and yeah, it's it's not great. So yeah, the okay. the the do notation gives us imperative reasoning where it's appropriate, right? We we want to use imperative reasoning where it makes sense to use imperative reasoning. We don't want to use it where we don't need it. And it's easier to read our code, or I guess no, I shouldn't say where we don't need it because technically you never need it. But like, we use it wherever it makes sense to. Um, and it's it, that's going to depend uh, from person to person. There are some people who are devoutly against the do notation entirely. Like some people say do consider it harmful. Like I've seen articles like that already. But like, in general, that's going to vary from person to person. It doesn't really make that big of a difference in my opinion. Obviously, other people disagree. But you know, to each his own. Um, I think. Generally, though, like the, the the general consensus is that yes, do is good. Use it uh, where it makes sense. Uh, when you're writing like a script, that's where you should use it. Where you're not writing little scripts, like if you're not like, like your business logic, is probably going to follow a sort of like script, right? Your business logic should be written using like this do notation. Uh, but if you're actually like implementing like your database layer or whatever, you don't really need to use that necessarily. That's yeah, that that's basically all there is to it. So don't 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 get too hung up on that. It's it's Haskell giving you more choices than you're used to. That's that's a common theme with functional programming is you get a lot more choices and you know analysis paralysis. It's one of the big issues that I think a lot of functional programmers have. And so we'll just leave it at it's 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 a stylistic choice. Functional programmers typically prefer. Yeah. Um, the declarative over the imperative. Yeah. Maybe we just leave it at that for now, just because yep, we do have a we do have a tic tac toe or whatever. What was it we're implementing we're, we're again? We're implementing rock paper scissors. Today. Oh, rock paper scissors. Yeah, yeah right. We're implementing rock paper scissors. <laughs> okay. So we're we're doing something like relatively. We're doing something relatively simple. Uh, so the book has some examples of like how you would start with uh, something like this, and they talk about like diagrams. Uh, for something as simple as this, I think we can start with something a little more basic. So a diam so this is this like the functional programming version of UML that we're about to do? Yes. Except okay, cool. there except 
uh, functional programming doesn't really have a concept of UML because no one's actually really bothered to like hash out, you know, an actual uh, best practices guide for engineering because everybody disagrees with each other because <laughs> there's so many <laughs> options. There's just like, well, I could write it this style, but I can also write this other style, and I can also write this other style, and you know, some people are going to be in one camp, and choices. Be in another camp. <laughs> OOP is nice because it, it takes all the control away from you and says, here, everything must be a class. Everything is an object. Everything is, yeah. And so everything is uh, unified, and that's why you're able to write UML so easily. Whereas in oh. functional programming, you just have all I, this choice. You have so many different styles. You, Nobody agrees. It's kind of a mess. And uh, that, that I can definitely say is a drug of the functional approach, but. On the other hand, having that extra control can be oh, you're, very nice. You're roboting slightly. You're kind of... Okay, I think it's better now, but there were a couple oh. points where you were coming in and out. But uh, anyway, yeah. I think I, think I got you. It was like, uh, there's so much choice in functional programming. People are disagreeing. One thing that's kind of nice in a way about OO is that everything... You have like one giant hammer, and so you just smash everything with the hammer. And you yeah. don't have to think about using other tools, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Uh, anyway, how do I how do I put text in this? So yeah. what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow what the book says. The, the book does something called well, it follows a domain driven design. So this is something that you're probably familiar with if you're an object oriented programmer as well. Um, they they separate the application into different layers, and so uh, he describes like the application layer as being like your kind of like top level layer where you handle like passing in the config and stuff like that. And essentially, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to lay out our uh, our different layers here, similar to how you would uh, in uh, any uh, object-oriented program. But we're not using UML; we're just using like little blocks and stuff. So we're going to have an application layer uh, because uh, this is a rock paper scissors, um, and I want to make it multiplayer. By the way, uh, we're also going to have. A, the ability to fork processes. So we're going to have like. Single a, player is pretty sad. Single player rock, paper, scissors is pretty sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have the ability to fork different processes. Um, the processes that we fork are going to be for the first player and the second player, right? So that way they can send their uh, responses or requests like in parallel. So that way, if cool. player two sends their, um, you know, I, I choose rock before player one chooses, uh, then it's okay. It's not going to like not be able to handle that. So that's what that's for. Uh, the book also suggests using a business logic layer. So they call it Lang L. I don't really know why, actually. <laughs> uh, but that's, that, that's what they call it. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like the, the whole uh, Lang stuff. A bit later. So uh, I have a I have a question that's not specifically related to functional programming, but just before sure. we get in too deep, so you said uh, you want to fork, so you have two different processes, one for each player, and we have like um, a main process as well, and the main process as well. Mm -hmm. Like, um, when I think of the simplest approach to this problem, I think okay, so you know, like you you have a single thread, the thread first asks player one, okay, what's your choice? Ask player two. Well, actually, I guess it depends on how multiplayer is going to be set up here. Are we thinking like real time? Like, uh, well, well, how about this? Maybe could we just take a second to say like this is what we're going for in the end. Like this is what this is what the game is going to look like. You have player one, player two. Here's how they are uh, entering their their choices into the console. Just so we have a target of what sure. we're going yeah, for. Yeah, we should. Yeah, we should. We should hash out the requirements a little bit more clearly. Um, I don't know if I should like write it down or something. Uh, so I actually Even have, just like, like, ver like <laughs> verbally or however you want to do it, just so we know what our target is. And that's all a good thing to right. I actually do have like a, a, a design that I kind of hashed out earlier that this is uh, going to build towards. Uh, this isn't actually complete. I was, this isn't, I, I was just like playing around with stuff. But uh, essentially my idea is that we'll have, um, there'll be like a server and a client Right, those are server and client applications. Uh, the way I was looking at this was the server is going to spawn two threads, right? Uh, one for the client, one for the server, or not for the server, one, one for each of the players. Okay, cool. 
and what it's going to do is it's going to wait for connections and then the match begins and so when the match begins uh, it's just gonna wait uh, on both threads for each player's response right so wait for responses and once it gets the responses it's just going to calculate the winner and send a winner back to clients so that's a that's a very like simplified version of what I'm going for okay. well that's that's clear now so all right cool yeah glad we went over that yeah, and then there'll be uh, two separate clients. Uh, I imagine what the clients are going to do is they're going to connect to server. Uh, they're going to be they're going to wait until uh, opponent is found, and once it's found, they're going to send their uh, send their response. And they're just going to wait until calculation is done, and then they're just going to, you know, print the the winner out to the console. And that's uh, that, that, that's pretty much it. So yeah, yeah, I I think what you're saying could have worked as well. Like we could have asked player one for their input first, and then asked player two for their input. But I I still. I don't know if that would have avoided having to have two threads, though. Because, uh, I guess, hmm. I mean, I th I don't know. At first, at first look, of course, maybe thinking about this more carefully, you'd yeah. find some other cases. But I think you could do it with a single thread. But it would maybe not be the best experience. If I think about simulating rock, paper, scissors, it is kind of like... A parallel thing right you don't want to get like a message saying like waiting for player one to choose whether they're going to choose rock paper scissors yeah right because it, <laughs> it should be like in parallel it shouldn't be it shouldn't be sequential like that so anyway i think having two threads is good now that i understand kind of what we're going for and i think that'd be the best the best player experience right so that's what i'm aiming for uh those are the requirements i guess very roughly cool rough outline um, so yeah back to the diagram stuff uh, let me add some arrows here so we're going to have our application layer depend on our business logic layer it's also going to depend on the process layer and in our business logic that's where we're going to actually do the bulk of our stuff uh, I think this is where we want to do our networking. So uh, the, the way that I have it laid out uh, in here, I think, was... Yeah, it depends on networking. We're going to have like a logger layer. We're going to have like some kind of state. So that's what these will be. Right, and this is just how we're gonna start for now. Uh, we can obviously change this later as we go along, but this is this is just how I'm starting. Now we're gonna get into the interesting stuff. So, uh, our business logic is going to depend on uh, these three uh, layers essentially. Um, the way that we do this is a little bit different from how you might expect. So in in uh, Java, you might have like an interface for your network layer, right? Like this could have been like a database layer instead. And you could have had like a, an interface with like a send and receive methods on it, that kind of thing. Uh, the logging layer, right? You might have like a uh, a, a logging uh, a logging interface or what, what do they call those? Things? Lo logging facades, right? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Just making sure that you're still there. And uh, th this state thing, uh, this is something that the book has. 
it's because we're in a purely functional programming language, we kind of need to pass through like the, the, the global state around. And... Interesting. Whereas in OO, you might have that just as part of the business logic layer. Yeah, like you as... might have like a yeah you you might have um a, a, like a singleton or something. I don't really know, right? Or, or you could just have like a local variables that you kind of like mutate. Um, some member variables some of like, like setters or whatever. Yeah. Right. So they have their own like state L thing here. And the interesting part comes when we actually start trying to implement this stuff. So uh, I'm not going to get into this stuff just yet. We're going to have actually have to try and... Uh, how am I going to start with this actually? Let's, let's start with the networking layer first. I think that's where I want to start just to demonstrate. So... Uh, I have the book with me. <laughs> I have it on my iPad that I got for Christmas. So, hooray. I'm going to open that right now. Because this can be kind of tricky to understand. But l l let, me, uh, let me detail the approach at a high level of what we're going to be doing. So, in functional programming, we don't generally use interfaces for this kind of thing. Instead, we use something called an EDSL. And what EDSL stands for is Embedded Domain Specific Language. So each of our layers is going to have its own uh, domain specific uh, language to uh, d describe the logic in it. And uh, I guess the the way that you can think of it is as we define like a, a sort of like set of instructions that are allowed in that language, and then we can write scripts with that. Uh, so for the networking layer, we might have some kind of network data type, and it has different um, different constructors. We could have like a send message constructor that corresponds to the instruction of sending a message to um, one of our clients. We need to have like a receive message instruction. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have a script that returns a network uh, L. And what that script is going to look like is an imperative script using do notation, where each instruction is going to use one of these, um, these constructors as like the actual instructions in the script, or the actual commands in the script. So we could like send a message to client one, for example. We could receive message from client two, and if we want to store that message in a variable, we could use this arrow and store it in a received message. And then after that, we could send another message, like so. The client too, and we could actually, you know, we, we should actually specify what the message is, right? Like, this one should be like hi, this one could be like hello, something like that. And this script is going to be, um, uh, it, it's not actually going to be executed until we interpret it with some kind of interpreter, right? So here's where we get into the inversion of control part of, uh, you know, of the, this approach. Uh, so in Java, you have like an interface, right? And you implement different, um, you, you implement the interface for the different classes and stuff, right? But you can code to that interface. What you can do with the EDSL is you can code uh, to uh, this sort of functional interface, right? Where we, we write the script of uh, different things that can happen. And now I can actually create a mock interpreter, which is going to interpret the network language. Uh, this one can return like unit. And what this mock interpreter is going to do is it's going to take our script that we had, that we that we pass in, and it's going to actually uh, interpret like it's it's going to do like that pattern matching thing that you've seen before, uh, where. You, it, it's kind of like a switch statement, right? You you see that we, we got a send message instruction that has like a client and that has like an actual message attached to it. And now what we can do is we can 
mock that by having it just do like a, I don't know. Well, that's I can't do put string line because that does I O, but uh, we can just return unit for that, right? Like th 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 this function is supposed to return unit, so we can just mock uh, each of the individual instructions and how they're inter or no, not the instructions themselves, but we can mock how we interpret the instructions. And for the real interpreter, we'll do the same thing. We'll take the network layer, we'll do that. We'll take our send message instruction. And this one can actually like open a, a connection or like or take an existing TCP connection. We can like pass in the connection as well. I don't know. Right? And do something like connection like send. We'll give it the client and the message and then there you go. So this is how we attain um, this sort of inversion of control without having to use interfaces. Does, does, does that make sense? <laughs> I think so. Taking it back to like OO land. So you have an interface, you can mock it out really easily for your unit tests or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you have another implementation that actually does what you want it to. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's the essence of what we're doing. We use the same script, our same logic. That's like having the function that codes against the interfaces. And then we actually implement um, those uh, methods in different ways by writing different interpreters instead. So th this is the functional or, uh, the, the functional way of doing this. Uh, you can also use type classes to do the same thing or like something similar. Um, and that's a lot closer to the object-oriented way of using interfaces. But that's not what the book recommends. The book recommends this EDSL approach. And I think the main reason why they do that is because you'll notice that uh, this thing takes uh, a network language. Actually, the, the script itself returns a network uh, script, right? Um, what's nice about that is it's not doing any IO or anything. Like You can actually specify specifically that the only things you can do in this script are in these instructions that come from the uh, networking uh, language. And again, it seems like send message and receive message would be like a function on a class or something like that. Or like an, yeah, an, that's, could, or that's another what class. you normally do in yeah. object-oriented programming. Those would be your interface methods, right? Right. So instead of data network, it would be like interface network, and then you'd have a method send message and a method receive message in that interface. Right, and then you would have the code that codes to the interface, like you're saying. And yeah. we have our implementations of the interface. Exactly. And uh, away we go. OK, cool. Yeah, a couple of things. Like, um, it's interesting that we have these functions that are basically we're just executing them for their side effects, right? Like the real interpreter. Mm -hmm. Like, it's returning basically void. And we just want it because it has these side effects that we, that we need. So does that make it, because it has side effects, does that make it not somehow pure functionally? Uh, no, it's still pure due to some technicalities. <laughs> it, it, it's because... Some loopholes we are exploiting. <laughs> we're, this, is, this is actually um, the type for a singleton value. So uh, that's the same thing as if I define a type, I don't know, singleton. And I gave it a constructor, make singleton. And... It doesn't. It, it like this thing doesn't actually contain any data. It's literally just a type with a single value in it, which is even less than what a boolean has, right? Like a boolean, you might define it as like data bool equals true or false, right? But this thing doesn't even have a second variant to it. Like you, there's there's nothing else here. It's literally just the the, the one variant. Um, so this is basically uh, it's not returning nothing. It's returning a value. It's returning a uh, th this uh, singleton value. And that's what every function that returns this. Uh, th this thing is called unit, by the way. So we can actually uh, be more explicit. Call it unit. Make unit. Uh, they call it uh, this, which is the same thing. Or, or that might be an alias for unit. I don't know. I don't know how it's defined, but th that's just called unit. And so uh, void isn't exactly void. It's not actually not returning anything. It's, it's still returning a value. 
when you call something that returns IO unit, that's actually just returning some instruction uh, like this, like, like the send message instruction. It's actually returning like a data type called like put string line, for example. It's, a, it's actually an instruction. And the, what's going to happen is the Haskell runtime is going to take these instructions, right? And it's, oh god, I don't have the example here. It's, it, it was in main here, yeah. It's going to take this IO unit and it's going to actually run its own interpreter on all the different things that IO can do. So IO is actually its own language, just like this network language. It's just that we don't define the interpreter for it. No, we, we, don't, we can't even control the interpreter for it. IO is kind of special in its own way. Uh, the, 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 the Haskell runtime has its own interpreter for IO. And it has like it's kind of like hard coded into the Haskell uh, runtime, uh, which instructions it recognizes. So when you when you call right. the put string line function, it actually creates a put string line. Um, uh, it actually uses the put string line constructor and actually creates a, 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 one of these uh, instructions as like a data type instead of you know calling it as a function. It, it, it's a weird little trick of the mind, I guess. But hmm. at the end of the yeah, day, it's, interesting. it's going to be like a bunch just... of uh, instructions, and it's going to interpret them. Sorry, go on. Right. Um, I'm just noticing the similarity between these uh, sort of these languages that we're building that have this, uh, you know, finite set of, I don't know, terms, right? Like send message and receive message. Yeah. And that just yeah, I know we've talked about this before, but like going back to the interface or like the class sort of parallel there, mm -hmm. how it's very similar to a class that would have like, these are the functions that the class has. These are what you can do with the class. Similar yeah. to, yeah, like this, this yeah. language. That, that's anyway. exactly um, what that's doing. Well, not, not exactly because obviously we're not using classes. We're not like tying our methods to any particular like structure or data. It's just a, uh, like our script is just a script. It's just it's like a, almost like a static uh, function, just kind of floating in 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 in, in cyberspace. <laughs> so cyber wires. Okay, cool. Then, yeah. Yeah. The other the other quick thing. Um, so this practice of having an interface, and then you have your mock that you can test easily, mm -hmm. and then you have the actual implementation that does what you want. Um, that's a very, you know, cool idea. Although there are some like, um, like what I've seen at my my work a couple times. It, well, not a couple times, like all the time. Is that uh, these testing frameworks? Like we use Java, so like, um, like Mockito or yeah, EasyMock, yeah. that sort of stuff. It can kind of like remove the need to have a mock implementation of your interface because you can just say like okay this is the class i want to mock this is the function i want to mock on that class and i want you just to return this so it's kind of interesting and then the thing that's extra interesting after that is that like we're still using interfaces all over our code base but oh, it's yeah. like i mean like you need the interfaces anyway because if you don't have the interface you can't use the the mocker as far as i know like i'm i don't I'm not familiar with Mockito specifically, but we've done similar things with like Scala Mock and Scala, and I'm pretty sure you still need to define the interface because what, what, all that that's, that thing is doing is it's automatically generating uh, this mock implementation for you. It's just a little bit of syntactic okay. sugar. I don't think it's actually yeah. doing anything magic. Like you can't but I was just thinking, like, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. But uh -huh. uh, if you didn't have the interface and you just had a class, you know, instead of whatever, like, you know, a network that was an interface to just have a class called network. You yeah. could use easy mock or Makita or whatever on that to mock it however you wanted in your tests. Okay. And the thing that I find interesting and like that I've I've seen in these like professional code bases is yeah. we still have an interface, even though that's how we test. And the interface always has one implementation, which is like the name of the interface IMPL. And then it just makes me think like, what's the point of having an interface? If we're not using it for testing. And the only implementation we have is this the one called IMPO. Like, why not just skip the middleman and just create, <laughs> just create a single class? Like, what's the point of having the interface if you're not going to use it for anything other okay. than a single you're implementation? Like, you're not going to test. Um, yeah. I mean, it could depend, you know, right? Like, uh, the interface should generally capture your logic, and the implementation details are pushed to the actual well, implementations of the interface, right? Um, so, like. 
if you want to swap out the implementation with a different one, that's a reason why you might want to do that. I mean, obviously, that's going to depend, right? Like, if you do genuinely see that there's absolutely no reason you would ever want to swap the implementation for another one, then, yeah, I mean, you, you might have a point. Maybe there should only be one implementation. Maybe that we don't need to have, like, the extra, the, the extra layer of abstraction, right? Yeah. Well, that's, that's it exactly. Like, as far as I can tell, there are kind of two use, like, two main use cases for an for an interface it's the testing case mocking making mocking easily and then the swapping swapping out like you were like you were mentioning yeah but i, I see the, all the, the third one is the, 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 the third usage is being able to work with other people in parallel because once you're coding to an interface um as long as people aren't changing the interfaces mm, then that's a good point it's yeah. easier to yeah you can have somebody like who's consuming the interface and then somebody who's actually working on the implementation kind of they can do that in parallel that's a good point yeah, it, it promotes uh, parallel workflows, so. Yes, okay, fair point. Anyway, that was a bit of a diversion. Let's, uh, yeah, yeah continue on, but. Uh, so that's basically all that I have here. So I, I should preface this by saying that I don't think I'm going to finish the entire thing today. It's probably going to take a couple of streams to get this whole thing done, because there's kind of a lot to it, even though it's a, it is a small application, but it, there, there's kind of a lot to this um this approach that the book uses. It's a little bit boilerplate-y, I think, which is kind of annoying. But that's just the functional way of doing things. And there might be better ways of doing this in the future if people use, like, I don't know, template Haskell or some kind of, like, macro system to auto-generate the mocks and stuff. Actually, there there probably are libraries that auto-generate the mocks like this. But, yeah, I, I, I'm not using any of them right now. I'm just kind of following what the book has. Fair enough. If but, I could make a vote for a, f a future video after you've gone through and implemented everything that you want to, mm -hmm. if you could do one that's comparing an object-oriented implementation of this same problem, same program oh, yeah, to totally. sort of discuss the pros and cons and like why you might want to go with one or the other, I'd find oh, that. I like super that idea. I like that idea a lot. I'm I'm actually thinking of doing an implementation in Rust and another implementation in Idris, but we can throw one uh, in a Java one as well, and I think that'd be kind yeah, of yeah. interesting. I think that'd be a good bridge for a lot of people like myself that yeah. are more from the OL world and it make the sort of like mapping concepts over a little bit more. Yeah, easy. no, I, I think that's a great idea. I think that's fantastic. I, I'd love to do a comparison. And uh, part of the reason why I'm doing this exercise is to do some comparisons as well, because there are some things that I know about Haskell that uh, make it undesirable for some developers. And I want to test like, how bad is it? Like certain things like compile times, right? Like does the approach that I'm about to use tank compile times like really badly compared to the implementation in say Rust? Like Rust is known for having slower compile times as well, but it's not nearly as bad as Haskell as far as I know. So I, I'm, I want to do some comparisons there. I want to do some compar comparisons against Java to see like, because I know Java compiles relatively quickly, right? And so if this thing turns out to be a lot slower, then we will we'll start to see like some of the, the cracks forming. Like yeah, how bad cool. how bad is this approach? Um, I, I also want to do one in Idris, mostly because I want to see like what happens if we introduce dependent types. How much uh, more difficult does it uh, become, or how much easier does it become to like encode the constraints and stuff like that? Uh, which constraints do we think we can practically encode in this problem? And do, and, and the, the other question I have to answer there is: Does the Idris ecosystem support enough of these, uh, you know, like the networking stuff? Uh, in order for me to actually be able to implement mm, right yeah it's cause... something that's a little bit more on the bleeding edge or like exactly. those sort of base base uh i keep wanting to call them class but the base functionality of the language is it like developed sufficiently yeah to make this not a excruciating process yeah because i know i can do this in rust very easily like i don't even have to like think about that but for idris i don't know if it's at a state where I can easily implement something like this and it'll actually just work right, right, like right out of the box. So that's another question that I do want to have answered. And I think that would be a very helpful exercise. So yeah, that's uh, that's those are the main reasons why I have picked Haskell today. <laughs> cool. So let's start by trying to implement some of this stuff, I guess. Uh, I've kind of outlined how the languages are going to look. So here are the instructions that I want, but I haven't actually outlined what the method or or what their constructors are going to look like. Like, what was the type signature of that constructor? Uh, that's going to be kind of interesting. 
Uh, I do have like the domain data type, so let's get that in. Let's get these in first. So, put that up here. Oops. You're probably wondering why I'm doing everything in one file. Uh, that's just bad practice. That's just me being lazy. I don't actually know how I want to organize everything quite yet, so I'm going to do it all in one file to start with, and then we'll move. Pull her out later. Yeah. All right. I remember so... when I was at university, I just always remember this one guy who said, your goal is first you make it, uh, first you make it run, then you make it fast, then you make it pretty. And then I thought that was a really good point. And then my professor was like, well, why can't you do all those things at once? Or something well, like that. <laughs> well, but I always well. thought that was kind of like a nice a nice way to do it. So let's just make a run first of all. And then we can worry about making it pretty and refactor yeah, 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 it and yeah, yeah. all that stuff. My, uh, the, the people I've spoken to are like, uh, make it work, uh, make it fast, make it good. Mm, interesting. Yeah. A little twist there. Yeah, everyone seems to have their own version of that, but which is kind of funny. But yeah, I, I've definitely heard that sort of a saying before. Uh, so these are our domain data types down here. Um, obviously, player is going to indicate which player we're talking to. So player one or player two with the player input. Uh, so either going to be rock, paper, or scissors. Go figure. Uh, I have these request and response types. Uh, so this first word is always going to be the constructor name. The second is the type of the arguments that it can take. So uh, to explain that in a little bit more detail here, that's sort of like having an enum in Rust called request. And in this enum, you might have uh, a connect thing that takes a player. Uh, you might have another thing called player disconnect that takes a player and a winner message that takes a game result like so and if you want to construct one of these you just go like oh I want to create a request connect player so so the the, the bar means like either this or this or this you, you, you uh, it's pretty obvious from like the context of these things above but yeah that, that's all that this is saying we'd have to do some okay. kind of like switch or pattern match to figure out which of the three variants we got from the requests that were given. This is this is a feature that I really wish more languages had. Like, I'm I, I think Go doesn't have this. And it, it's just something that's just so nice to be able to just you know define your data types like this. It's it's just so convenient. Uh, response similar. We have like the player input. It, we either get a player input or we get a disconnect message from the uh, client. So the disconnect message can either come from the client sending it directly to us. They, like they say, I quit, I don't want to play anymore. Or if uh, they time out, so somehow they get disconnected or they like control C and kill their thing. Uh, after, uh, I, I, I will have some kind of timeout on the server side that says, oh, uh, this guy didn't respond in this amount of time, so we're just going to say this guy disconnected. And uh, that's it. So that's what this is for. And the game result will be uh, deciding like who won, player one, player two, or if there's a draw. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, yeah, that, those are just like the basic data types that we're going to be using. So now we got to actually define the languages. So I'm going to actually try and start with the. Actually, we should start from the app language. I think that makes the most sense. So I'm looking at my book here. Let's see. Because I don't exactly know what this is going to look like. <laughs> it's been. A little while since I covered that part of the book. I'm about two thirds through this book, by the way, like just over two thirds through the book. So I don't know all the techniques yet. So some of the stuff I do might be suboptimal for now. I don't really care. I just want to get my hands dirty and try some of this stuff and learn because otherwise it's really, it really doesn't help to just like read stuff and, you know, not really absorb it. You gotta, sure. you gotta actually practice. Yep. All right, so what do we have here? Okay, so they have like a fork process function. Data app f. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, where, okay, this next is a generic uh, parameter. I forgot to talk about generics a little bit. 
Um, the way that generics work in Haskell is weird. Um, if you want to do a generic, you just use a lowercase letter. That's all. Because all the types are in uppercase, right? Like, they're, they're like int to, oh my god, it's not. So this is int to uh, some generic uh, type A. Okay. This is A to A. That, 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 that's all this is, but you can also uh, just use any kind of lowercase string like next. So this is just a this is a data type that's parameterized by some type parameter. You could call it a type constructor. Whoa. And they have this interesting constructor syntax. Uh, so here's what they have in the book. Again, these lowercase things are all um, type parameters. Okay, this is for evaluating our business logic language. Oops. So from what I can tell in the book, uh, this allows us to run scripts from the business logic layer in the application layer, hence why we have those like dependencies uh, in the diagram. And it, when we say that Lang L has a dependency on state and network and logger, it means that we can actually call send message and receive message from Lang L. We can also right. call the log functions from the logging language in our uh, Lang L script. Sure. So in OO land, we would have some member variable of like type logger, type whatever, and you could just call them as you needed from the business yeah, logic. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that's that's roughly equivalent. Yeah, I, I hadn't actually thought about that. So it's good that you're thinking about those things for the comparison that we're going to probably be doing later. Okay, they also have fork process, which is similar. This one takes a lang l that returns unit. This takes a okay. This is a a lambda or a function that you can pass in a first class function. You know, so this is a function that takes unit and returns next, and then returns an app f next. What is next again? Next is some generic you were saying. Yeah, next is a generic. Uh, yeah, this is some really interesting syntax because you can't really do this kind of stuff in Rust or other languages so easily. Uh, the way that this works is kind of... Actually, let me explain the, the this data where syntax a bit because it's, a, it's really confusing. When I first encountered it, I was so confused by this. It didn't make any sense to me. So let's redefine bool again. But this time we're going to use where syntax. So this is how you define bool using where syntax. That's it. The Each of these things is a different constructor. And all the stuff on the right hand side is the arguments. And then on the right side of that last arrow will be uh, some, the, 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 the type itself. Um, the reason why we do it this way is because this allows us to define certain things inductively. Like if we were to define natural numbers, we could define a natural number as zero, right? And we could just say zero is a natural number. And if we wanted to define successor, we could say like a natural number is either, uh, it's either zero or it's the successor of another natural number. So this is an inductive definition of a natural number. We can give um, we can give the, the successor uh, constructor a zero, right? That's this first argument, and it'll give us another natural number, is what that's saying. And, gotcha. yep. and if we give it one, right, which is the successor of zero, then we get the successor of successor of zero, which will also get us a nat. So this, this generates an entire like natural number data structure inductively. So that's the reason why they have this syntax, it's because sometimes you want to use induction in your data types. And that's a very powerful concept. Um, so similarly here, uh, when we have multiple arguments like this, that's kind of like defining like a, a tuple almost, right? Like I could define a tuple data type here, where uh, we call we'll have a single constructor called make tuple, and uh, what that might look like is you'll take an A and a B, and you'll return a tuple of type A and B. Uh, should add type parameters there. And there you go. And the syntactic sugar for constructing a tuple might look like this, right? So this this just desugars to make tuple and then yeah. 
So that's a that's a quick rundown of the, I guess this is like inductive uh, definition syntax. Um, you can use it for basically everything. It's like a strict uh, superset of what this syntax up here does. But this syntax up here is a lot easier to read, in my opinion, if you're just defining like some data types real quick. But yeah, if you want to keep your language small and not have too much uh, extra syntax, just give this option down here. This syntax will let you do pretty much everything in your language. And I know that this is what uh, the kind programming language does. Uh, kind is the rename of formality. Formality used to be called formality. Now it's called kind. And they, they only support one syntax, which is like this one. They don't support the other two, the other syntax up here, because that's... Yeah, definitely the first one seems easier to read to me, especially when you get multiple arrows and parentheses. It gets a little bit noisy, tricky to... Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I generally agree with that. But if you want to keep your language small like and have very few features, kind of like Go, right? Like Go doesn't have very many language features, then you want to just do something like this. And that can also keep compile times down a bit as well if you have like a relatively small language. Anyway, we're, we're getting into like language design talk. Although technically we are designing a language right now with this, so my, uh, tangentially related. <laughs> uh, the next step that they do is they create a type alias called app l equals free app f. What is free? Free is this weird magical thing that we have in our dependencies. So if we look back at, uh, oh, actually I don't want to do that. Uh, shoot. Well, actually we're not going to look at it then. <laughs> uh, free is uh, is short for free monad so this will create a free monad from this that'll give us the ability to use do syntax uh, the do syntax only works with things that are n that are monads so uh, if you've ever wondered like what monads are uh, don't don't ask what a monad is just learn how to use monads and like what what they enable and uh, you'll go a lot further in life uh, the, the, the main point of monads is it allows you to use that do notation, and that lets us write these imperative programs. Uh, without, If IO wasn't a monad, we wouldn't be able to use do, and we wouldn't be able to write imperative programs, and our life would be miserable. Okay, good enough for me. I don't really know what a monad is, but I know now that we need them to use do, where exactly. you do all the fun stuff in your program. Yeah, that's, that's all you really need to know. So uh, the reason why we use free is because app f is not naturally a, a monad on its own uh, we need to uh, if we apply this free thing though to app we can turn it into a monad for free uh, with one caveat and that caveat is we actually need to I think implement a functor instance for this so we have to implement so uh, what, what do I mean by functor instance I mean there's a functor interface essentially in Haskell uh, you can think of it as being analogous to like your uh, Java interface, and that uh, functor interface uh, has a map method in it. So app f needs to implement the map method, otherwise uh, we can't use free on it and get that sweet juicy do notation that we want so badly. That's literally the only reason why we're using free, by the way. <laughs> the, the, the only reason we use free is because we want to be able to use that, 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 that schmexy do notation. <laughs> so it's not quite free. I mean, you got to implement a couple things. In order yeah, to it's make not it quite work. free. It's a little bit annoying, and it's not. It's it's, it's not that clean. Uh, so how the heck do you yeah. do this? Again? And from App F's perspective, App F isn't becoming more free. It's becoming yeah. enslaved as a monad. You must be a monad. <laughs> well, App F it doesn't get changed into a monad. We create a new monad called called App L uh, from. App F. Oh, app F I itself see. Okay. is a monad, but app L is a monad. We just Why generated... not app M? Yeah, we monad. generated the monad from the thing that wasn't a monad. Okay. Uh, how the heck do you implement this? This is the part that I don't like about this, is that you have to figure out how to implement like the functor instance and stuff, and that's like that's a, that's such a pain. Who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. There's a I think there's a shortcut for this though. Oh, let's look it up. <laughs> There's a way to do this. Uh, Google. Derive functor Haskell. Yeah, they, they, they have language extensions that you can kind of... It's kind of like the, the pool of extra features that aren't part of the base language that you can 
use, and it's kind of it's kind of sneaky. Oh yeah. What's that C plus plus thing that's like that? It's like everything you wish was in the standard library, but isn't in the standard library. What's that thing <laughs> called? I don't know. I, can't remember. I actually have no idea. All right, we need to put this baby at the top of our file. Right here. Bam. Boom. Uh boom. Bam bam. I can't I can't paste. What's wrong? <laughs> Windows, why? Why do you hate me? Oh, what? It pastes it down there. Okay. <laughs> sure. We're gonna copy and paste it up here then. Also it didn't even paste the entire thing. So that's really cool. Well done. Windows. Okay. Uh, we don't need derived foldable. We don't need that stuff. This is useless. Derived functor. Okay. So do you know what that does? That allows nope. us to do this. So you see this data here? I'm going to cover chat because there's no one in chat anyway. <laughs> we're going to do the same thing and we're going to add a derived... Okay. I, this, this better work. Deriving functor. And now I don't have to implement the interface manually myself. I can just add oh. that as a tag. So is Vim smart enough to know that that's a keyword in Haskell? Uh, like oh, it... you know what? Yeah, actually, it, it, it is smart enough somehow. I guess uh, Vim, uh, has, oh, yeah. so Vim has syntax highlighting for, uh, for Haskell, I didn't realize. Because, yeah, I actually don't have any plugins installed for Vim. We'll just do that again. Just try and make sure that this thing actually compiles. I hope that this works, because that would be nice. Uh, we can do this. Yeah, we can. Right. So we're somehow just like magically implementing this functor interface by using this deriving keyword. Yep, it's an auto okay. uh, implementation. It just takes like a. It, it tries its best to do like a default implementation. This is not always going to be the right implementation, so doing it manually is preferred in some cases, but. Uh, in this case, I think it'll automatically derive the correct one, but the only way to do that is to, uh, you know, use this. We have to add, a, we have to extend the language oh, with an no. extra feature. That's bad. <laughs> oh, I also... we don't have a lang l. We didn't discover. We didn't. Uh, we didn't actually uh, define huh. that. So that makes sense. That'll do it. Free. I don't have that because I didn't import it. Uh, so we have to import control.monad.free, I think? I don't remember. Huh. <laughs> I Interesting. Don't, I so, how, so for IO, the import was different because it's built into the language, whereas control.monad.free is something that somebody... Yep, it's a library. We, yeah, it's, it's a dependency that we had to include. Okay. Yep, it's a third-party library. I, I downloaded it this morning. It's totally gotcha. not... Yeah, totally not part of the base language. So this... This approach that the book uses does depend on this free monad implementation, which you can write it yourself, but there's a library it's for It's like it. boilerplate, basically, right? Yeah, like why exactly. Not just, yeah. So there's a library for it. You might as well just import it. You right? may as well. Why reinvent the wheel, I say? Exactly. Uh, so this looks like it's pretty good. Let's, okay, let's do lang f uh, next where uh i don't know foo <laughs> foo what do we use lang lang f for again i'm losing the thread here the lang f is our business logic layer oh okay and we'll define lang l so why do we call it f like why not business lang that seems like a nat more natural name what's with the f and the l's and the Okay, the F stands for functor, I think, because we're going to derive this functor interface for it. Okay. And lang, I don't know why it's called lang. I would call, personally, my opinion would be to call this, like, business logic. F. Yes, that seems more That makes more sense, more to, sense, me. sense to me. Yeah. I don't know, there's probably a reason for, I don't think the book ever explained it, though. Okay. Lang is just so general. It's like lang. That has yeah, like a well, billion different meanings. <laughs> Especially here when everything is a language, right? Like yeah. this is a language. That's a language. The networking stuff is a language. I mean, I don't know. Anyway. Okay. Well, it's uh, a business logic. Gotcha. Oh, we can't free. We can't call free on that. Oh, that sucks. Ooh, I don't. 
think I thought this through because we had to derive functor for this. Okay, well, we Why can can't that. we call three on that? Because we haven't derived the thingy Yeah, because we haven't implemented the Wait. functor interface for that. Uh, okay, so hopefully good old uh, deriving will save us again here. Yeah. And now we can make it into a monad, and now we can use do on it, and then all of our problems will be... Oh. <laughs> Illegal generalized algebraic data declaration for lang f. What the heck? Uh, probably because I didn't actually give it arguments or something. Uh, you know, we'll just define the same... Oh, uh, I don't know. Oh, I didn't think about that. I, I also have to give my couple minute warning here. I gotta head out at 2, so right. I'm gonna have to drop off pretty soon. Alright, that's fine. I'll probably end stream soon then. And, uh, yeah, we'll pick it up again next time. Yeah, sure. No, I, I'm keen to, uh, keep going and see how this thing works. Like, I definitely do not understand everything I'm seeing, but it's nice to have like a guided tour of functional stuff because functional stuff has just been kind of like a scary dark forest that I'm afraid to go into. So it's nice I to have like totally a forest, a forest <laughs> ranger to lead me through. <laughs> Don't step on that. It will kill you. Uh, oh, okay. I'm, I'm doing something. So the way that I've defined Lang F here is wrong. That's that's why this doesn't work. I'll figure that out next time. Well, one last thing I want to talk about before we go here is uh, why this thing is defined the way that it is. Um, because otherwise it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, eval Lang does what it says on the tin. It's an instruction for evaluating a language. So it takes a script of our business logic language and then it'll return a value of type A. So A is this a polymorphic uh, variable. So if our script re were, was, was to return like an integer, then when we evaluate that script, it's going to return uh, an integer here, right? This next okay. thing is uh, the mechanism that allows us to chain our next instruction with the do notation. So after we uh, call eval lang, we might be able to do like a fork process. If we didn't have this part here, we wouldn't be able to um, turn it into a free monad, which is actually probably the reason why this thing is failing, because I, I have I, I don't have that. Uh, so yeah, that's that's basically what this part is. Uh, the way you think about it is your arguments are on the left-hand side of the arrows. Uh, you'll have... Uh, your second last argument will be this. It'll always be some kind of closure. Or, I, sorry, I shouldn't say closure. I, just some kind of lambda, some kind of function. And the last argument, or I guess the return, is going to be, well, the app f next, which is basically boilerplate at this point, right? Like, we, we know that all these are going to end with that. So that, right. that's how you're supposed to reason with this. So here in fork process, we, have, we take a script that uh, returns unit, right? Because all it's doing is forking a process. We're doing, we're, 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 it's purely for the side effect, right, of forking the process. And so the, the result of calling the fork process uh, quote unquote function is a unit, hence why this part is a unit. And then this arrow next is just boilerplate. Right. Okay, so it's the chain, like we're chaining, yes, we're chaining it because the result is a unit. And so then the input to the next thing is going to be a unit because that's what we got. Yep, uh, exactly. From the first step. Exactly. And then we do whatever next is. Mm -hmm. that, that's right. exactly okay. how you reason with it. Uh, so, yeah, that's about it. It's 2 o'clock. I know you have to go. Perfect. And, yes. Uh, yeah, that's I good, good think we can, uh, we can pick this up next time. I think that'll be fun. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for the, the guided tour, and I'll look forward to the next uh, the next stream. All right. Talk to you later. Cool. All right. Yeah, talk to you later. Bye.